Thank you. It's, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, putting this together, uh, having me come. And uh, uh, it's been uh, fun uh, hearing, uh, you know, from such a broad spectrum of, of uh, interests and styles. Um, just to let you know where I stand in things, I only prove trivial things. And if I find a algorithm improvement that gives me a factor of 10, I am happy for a week. Okay. <laughs> How does it scale? <laughs> Some people just, it doesn't matter at all, but uh, you know. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this is uh, Max Sylvester's uh, uh, project, um, and I thought it would be a very interesting one to sort of uh, get uh, some some broader perspective on uh, it's sort of a uh, you know discovery of something unusual which we just understand in sort of a um, a general way but also a nice little uh, algorithmic improvement along the way so uh, I want to start and uh, introduce things for a broad audience um, so this is going to be a pseudo blackboard talk I wrote my blackboard notes but then I I took a picture of them. Okay? But then interspersed with them are, are my nice, you know, graphics and things and a, and a few sort of more modern slides at the end. Okay, but uh, so the idea with the blackboard is uh, nice and slow. Uh, a lot of the material I'm introducing we've just heard in some of the previous introductions. So uh, hopefully uh, I can carry everybody along. Okay, so, so I'll introduce uh, DMRG and some of the uh, sort of uh, details of how it works. Uh, in particular, one of the very useful practical things is to do extrapolations in the truncation error. And um, so we had this idea, this started it to extrapolate with the energy variance. And uh, so um, in particular, we wanted to do this with uh, something called perfect sampling. Uh, and we found along the way that there were uh, very fat tails um, in the variance that were a surprise. And then we sort of traced this down to an unusual energy spectrum. Um, in the end, we were able to sort of deal with this uh, sort of uh, bad behavior and still get an improved extrapolation, uh, but it sort of makes an interesting story. Okay, and this is with Max also and Giuseppe Carleo. Okay, so introduction to DMRG. So we've all seen many times uh, the diagrams, uh, you know, uh, internal indices are summed over, external indices are usually uh, physical degrees of freedom, and we like to draw everything sort of in terms of, of diagrams. So for it, just as sort of a random example, uh, you know, a periodic matrix product state, um, you can connect the front and back lines and put this uh, set of tensors together. Um, the physical indices stick out, and uh, we trace over all the internal lines. The tracing uh, over all those lines just makes it look like uh, the trace form of a matrix product state where you have the matrices with an extra index on them that uh, uh, is sort of uh, left out as an external degree of freedom. Okay, so we're interested in simulating uh, Hamiltonians, ground states, uh, 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 low-lying states, finite temperature, that sort of thing. The Hamiltonians are uh, simple. They're usually very local, simple form. Um, and uh, so, you know, just very simple things. Um, of course, the Hilbert space is uh, always exponential, but the physical sites that we use um, live on a lattice in 1D, 2D, or 3D, okay? And that makes a big difference in terms of what happens. Um, <clears throat> so the, net, the, the diagrammatic notation for a one-dimensional state is shown here. This is the wave function psi. We have the uh, spin, say, indices uh, sticking up, and it's all one big block because we consider it as one big uh, tensor. The Hamiltonian looks like a similar tensor with indices sticking uh, down and up. It's like the primed indices and the unprimed indices. Okay, and we, and, the, and we know the Hamiltonian, we know exactly how to translate it into this very easily. Okay, in practice, we write both the wave function and the uh, Hamiltonian in terms of tensor networks. So in particular, the wave function is a matrix product state and uh, the Hamiltonian is an MPO. At least in, in terms of DMRG, this is how um, we're doing things. 
Okay, so if we uh, cut a wave function in two, uh, and this is the full wave function, not in matrix product state form, we cut the wave function in two, um, and then we can do an SVD uh, through the two degrees of freedom on the left and right. This is called the Schmidt decomposition, and look at the singular values. And the key to tensor networks in general is that the singular values are mostly near zero, and they can be neglected. So here there's a little plot of those. Um, so uh, in practice, we, so I, my notation, I think I, I, maybe I got there first, so I can keep my notation of M for this uh, bond dimension. Um, and uh, so, uh, so we, we have M values. And then uh, an important thing um, is the exact truncation error is the sum of all the singular values squared that we throw away. Okay, so we sum on lambda from m plus one up to however big the space is and it's cut in half, okay? And we call that uh, <coughs> uh, epsilon exact. And uh, we'll, you'll see this later. <coughs> uh, normally we don't have epsilon exact. This is you only get from an exact calculation uh, or with a little bit of extra work, but we have a proxy for it um, that's quite, uh, uh, quite a bit less accurate, but we make use of that, okay? Uh, but this is a good uh, measure of the error in the wave function. Uh, essentially, we're throwing away part of the wave function with the truncation, and the probability of the part of the wave function that we throw away is just this uh, epsilon exact. <clears throat> okay, um, the von Neumann entanglement entropy is given by this standard information theory formula for the uh, uh, singular values. And uh, for ground states, um, uh, S is small. Um, and it's uh, governed by what's called the area law, which has um, you know, been proved in certain cases. And in other cases, it's uh, you know, uh, 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 less proved. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the area law corresponds to just thinking of a three-dimensional system. And you cut it in two, say, down the middle. And the area of that cut uh, will give the dominant behavior of uh, the entanglement entropy for ground states. Um, <clears throat> there are often logarithmic corrections, uh, but the dominant portion is given by this area law. Okay, so if you're looking at a one-dimensional system, uh, well, the area is just a point, okay? So uh, the area law says that our entanglement is, is essentially a constant. And uh, this procedure works very well, and, and DMRG is based on that. And, uh, you know, you can think of a matrix product state as arising from this uh, cut between the two sides of the system, and keeping M states as being done between all uh, bonds of the system. And in the end, you end up with something that just has uh, tensors with uh, three legs, uh, and uh, it has this structure, and that's a matrix product state. Okay, so just to show a little bit of uh, fun data. Uh, so this is um, uh, a calculation um, of a Heisenberg chain um, with a little bit of disorder in it to split energy levels so that they're, you know, that you can sort of see all of them. And uh, it was a calculation that, uh, you know, you can't do too much larger than this, even though it's only length 8 or 12 here. Uh, because what I did with it was I got all of the uh, different uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So here are all the energy levels, and for n equals 12, you can see that they're totally dense, okay? But we see the spacing at uh, the extrema. Okay, then for each of those eigenstates, I uh, calculated the von Neumann entanglement entropy. Okay, and so the, the x-axis is just the energy. So we can pick out the ground state here, and we can see that at least on the scale of this uh, size, it has uh, a, uh, a small entanglement entropy. The maximum possible is up here, and uh, you know, there's, if this system had, say, less symmetries, you might see the, this uh, envelope reaching up near the maximum. It's for half the chain? So this is cut in the middle. So this is the 12 sites, so six sites on each side. Over here, you see the, uh, uh, the top of the spectrum. This is an antiferromagnetic system. So these are the two ferromagnetic states with a little bit of disorder splitting them. And they're 
product states they're not entangled at all. Is the gap to the maximum due to the SU2 symmetry, or is it uh, unclear where this comes from? Yeah, but most, I think mostly it's, that's it. And there's been further work it's on this big, right? that says that this is what I have here is not so typical, but I just love my graph here, so I haven't ever <laughs> bothered to you know, generalize it. Okay, so, so we, we think, you know, in terms of the way physicists think, we, we like to think of, of, of mostly classical systems, and that's very close to zero entanglement. And we think of this system as being, you know, somewhat strongly entangled, but still its entanglement entropy is extremely low compared to uh, what it could be. Okay. Uh, so here is the uh, entanglement entropy um, that is obtained uh, with the MRT, which I'll explain more later. Uh, but this is for n-site Heisenberg chains. And it's looking at, at it as the function of the system size. And all of these could be done with just a few minutes on my laptop. Um, so this is showing uh, two different systems. Uh, one, a spin one-half system. One with a spin one system with three different uh, values per site. Uh, the maximum entanglement entropy is uh, growing uh, linearly here. And um, we see some interesting behavior, which we understand pretty well. Um, maximum means overall eigenstates. Like from the so, so the maximum is just a simple calculation saying, what, how many degrees of freedom do you have in the half of the system? Oh, it's, it's yeah. upper bound. Yeah, yeah. Log of the, you know, yeah. Just a, <clears throat> okay. So um, you see some oscillations here, and we sort of understand that with sort of, you know, our sort of uh, cartoon approximate pictures of what these ground states look like. There's something called resonating valence bond theory that tells you that, you know, that you tend to have singlets that oscillate back and forth. And these can oscillate in a different way when you have an, uh, you know, the number of sites is uh, a multiple of four or just a multiple of two. And so we understand this little oscillation in the spin one half system. There's also an interesting thing going on in the spin one system. Um, so its uh, entanglement is going to a constant at large distances, but you have this bump here, which happens to come from um, some interesting topological excitations on the edges of the spin chain, some extra spin one half degrees of freedom, which can be entangled or not. And when you do a very large system, they, they, get un, un, they just get stuck. And so that's what you're that seeing here. And here you're seeing some entanglement of the edge degrees of freedom. But wouldn't you think that lowers the energy? Uh, so the, would this would tend to lower the energy. So this is a real DMRG calculation. If there's an interaction of 10 to the minus 15, it, it doesn't know about it. And so the interaction between these external degrees of freedom fall off exponentially. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm saying yeah, I would yeah. expect the, these interactions to lower the energy, not increase it. And, uh, sorry, yeah, that's entropy. Oh, but this is the entanglement entropy. Well, it's entropy. Yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with yeah, it. so there's a, like an extra log 2 that can lurk there. I see. Okay, that's yeah. what I should yeah. say. Yeah, just a clarification. You've said that uh, this, um, this fluctuation is due to commensurability with two and four. It is not a, so they are all even chains? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit more different if you do odd chains. Okay, so, so that's, uh, so the, the main takeaway from this is that, uh, you know, oh, and, and, and this, this spin one half is showing a log correction, a little bit more than the uh, area law, but you can see it's, it's a small uh, correction in practice. Okay. So, uh, so back to, to how uh, DMRG works. So for 2D problems, <clears throat> we can study a strip or a finite width cylinder. And what we do is we just map it to 1D. Uh, we choose, say, a snake path uh, through the system. We choose a finite width. <clears throat> and then the, the sort of 2D nature of the system just shows up as longer interactions, which we can put into the system. Uh, the drawback of this is that the computational effort uh, grows exponentially with the width of the system. So the area law is, is sort of... You know, you have the, the, the area law is, is essentially the width of the system. So the entanglement is growing. And so our matrix product state has to get bigger and bigger. And if you're going to do, want to do a wide 2D system, you should probably be using a 2D uh, tensor network. Uh, but there's some trade-off between where the 
you know, whether that's uh, more efficient because um, the calculational efforts for the, the 2D tensor networks tend to be uh, uh, much higher. Okay, so what we're interested in doing is uh, minimizing the energy to find uh, the ground state. Okay, so this is the sort of sandwich diagram that we're utilizing. So it's just uh, psi h psi. The Hamiltonian we've written as a matrix product operator, so it looks like a piece of a tensor network that's in the middle. Okay, and then the wave function appears twice at the bottom uh, and the top. The uh, Hamiltonian MPO, we just write it out at the start, or you know, we, we encode it in a simple program. It's very well understood. Um, so I'll call the uh, bond dimension for the MPO, which you know will vary along the chain, but the typical bond dimension here is, say, 3 to 5 for a simple 1D system. If you go to one of these 2D systems, say, a width 10 chain or cylinder, you know, it may range to, say, 20 or 40. And then for quantum chemistry applications, the Hamiltonian has a lot more complexity. And so there you're talking about much larger MPOs, say, you know, maybe typically in the range of, of thousands. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and there's a question whether you actually want to use an MPO representation in that case. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, so the density matrix renormalization group finds um, the wave function and the energy at the same time. And it, it uh, uses a combination of, of techniques. Um, probably the, if, if you haven't heard of it before, then the, think, think of it as alternating least squares is probably the easiest way to think about it. So we're going to sweep back and forth through the system, optimizing either one or two tensors at a time with the other ones uh, fixed. We call that sweeping. Okay, uh, an essential part of it is that there's a uh, sort of gauge choice. So a gauge choice in a, in a matrix product state uh, represents, you know, it, it, it sort of embodies the fact that you could always stick in X and an X inverse for two arbitrary matrices on each link and it won't change anything. So we can stick in these things and, and change the representation. And, and typically when you're working with matrix product states, you're doing this all the time. Uh, you're, you're changing which way they're orthonormal. So what we do is we uh, choose, an, choose this gauge to make them orthogonal in a particular way so that we have either this left orthogonality condition. So this is two of the tensors in a matrix product state uh, one on, for the same, it's, sorry, it's one tensor, but it's dagger right on top, and contract over the left index, and then that has to be equal to the identity, which is just this line here, or you do it the other way. What that allows you to do is if you have something, imagine you have a, like the sandwich here, but without the H, you can just work your way from the left and, and, and contract it without doing any work. It just all becomes an identity on the left. Okay, so we make use of this, and this gives us orthonormal subspaces to work in. And with those orthonormal subspaces, um, it's like we're wor working with the whole Hamiltonian, the energy is the, the energy of the whole system, even though we're working with just a few degrees of freedom. And in that, because it's orthonormal, the Langshaus is just our standard Langshaus for the, for the you know, standard eigenvalue problem, or, or the Davidson, which is just a slight generalization of it. Okay, and it, it works extremely well, um, you know, much better than you might expect if you just have experience with, say, gradient descents or something. It's a very nice algorithm. Okay, so to show a few more graphs, uh, this is, again, very old, uh, convergence in 1D. Um, so this is for a 2000 site uh, spin one half chain, and it shows uh, an important part of this, which is that the bond dimension to do a practical calculation, we start small. It's like why use thousand by thousand matrices when it's, it doesn't have any accuracy yet. So we like to steadily increase uh, the bond dimension. And so this is showing the iterations as, and so there's a line that starts above the, this and it's going over there and then back and then going back and forth like this path. And the bond dimension on each link is being uh, constrained to be these numbers, and so it steadily increases as we, as we uh, let it have bigger matrices. 
And then it's a 2,000 site chain, and we use the left-right reflection symmetry so that when we get to the center, we just take whatever we had on the left and flip it over to the right, and then it, it gives us a, a drop in energy, and then we, we go back to the left. Okay? So we can look at this. Um, this. This is the same calculation, and this is showing the bond dimension as it goes further along. And um, you can see uh, it, the, the, this is the error in the energy from, you know, what, uh, oh, this is from, from uh, beta onsatz, so we know it exactly, an exact solution to this uh, system. Uh, you can see some curvature, so this is on a semi-log scale, so if it was exponential, there it would be straight. And, um, but it's, uh, at first it's sort of above the excited state, uh, so it sort of knows that it's um, sort of a gapless system, but Eventually, you, it, the system, you're sort of at such low energies that the gap is above where you are, and then it tends to be more exponential here. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, sort of very nice uh, convergence of DMRG for this simple system. <clears throat> okay, so um, the uh, effective Hamiltonian that we use during a sweep diagrammatically looks like this. So we have these uh, edge tensors that look like an E, and what those are is um, a contraction of the half of the sandwich going off to the left until we just have um, these three external indices on the left. Okay, and that's this left edge, and we do the same thing on the right, and we're looking at some sort of site in the middle. Okay, and uh, so then this is the effective Hamiltonian, and we can say we had a a vector v that we wanted to multiply by the Hamiltonian. So we're working in this space of just these three indices. We stick it in here, and then we read out the answer v prime out there. Okay? And we never construct this uh, actual object because its uh, scaling would be m to the fourth, but if you, it's already factorized so that you can, if you just multiply it by the pieces, it'll be m cubed. Okay, now, um, in practice, we usually do the two-site algorithm, although there's been a gradual improvement of the one-site algorithms to uh, make them uh, uh, more competitive. And there's a cost to doing this because you have some extra degrees of freedom here. But uh, it looks like the same sort of Hamiltonian. You just leave open two uh, sites in the center, and you're working with a wave function with these extra indices. Okay, and when you do this, it's not just you know, using Langshaw's to find the optimal V, and then that's the new tensor. What you do here is a two-step process where you find an optimal two-site wave function, and then we use SVD to factorize it into the two tensors that uh, make up the matrix product state. Okay, now why do we uh, want to do this? Why do we want to pay this uh, little extra cost? Well, this speeds the convergence uh, significantly. Um, prevents the system from sort of getting stuck in local minima for many systems very nicely. Um, it allows us to increase the bond dimension efficiently. Okay, so this truncation has this extra vertical degree of freedom here, so it's like a 2m by 2m matrix that we're truncating. And, uh, and that's actually an, an advantage to, to uh, have this truncation, but it allows us to, to build up the m. And it does an important thing, it gives us an estimate of the truncation error. You know, I talked about the exact truncation error. It gives us an approximate surrogate for the truncation error, which is just the truncation error you got from this, this uh, uh, SVD during the middle of the algorithm. Okay. And then we can extrapolate in that truncation error, and, uh, you know, it generally it behaves linearly, and so this is this sort of uh, schematic behavior, and it's an extremely useful part of uh, the algorithm. So here's a, some real data. Um, so it shows a 12 by 6 square lattice Heisenberg model, and it shows a fit um, with uh, the circles, and then the, the uh, later sweeps were not used in the uh, fit, and you see they fall very right on the line, okay? And uh, so we have, we have protocols for using this. Um, it's, it's delicate um, because um, it depends on the history of the sweeping. So, for instance, if you've just increased 
the bond dimension by a factor of two, you'll probably, you, you'll, you should find just zero truncation error. And how do you extrapolate with that? So it, it depends on a sort of delicate keeping uh, sort of control about how you increase the number of states. And uh, so it's, it's nice, but it's, uh, it's, it's not ideal. Okay. Okay, so the weaknesses of the truncation error extrapolation, as I just said, it's tied to this two-site algorithm. You don't have it for the one site. And it's tied to the sweeping hi history, and it may fa fail for, for some non-local Hamiltonians. Okay, so, so the start of this project was to say, well, what, how about extrapolating with the variance? And the immediate problem that was, has been known for a while is that the variance, calculating the variance is sort of expensive. Okay, so to calculate the variance of the energy, what is it? Oh, it's just, we know the energy for the state that we have. We do h minus e, square it, and evaluate that. Okay, that's just a slightly thicker sandwich that we need to contract. Okay, when you want to understand the calculation time of these sandwiches, you want to look at the inter intermediate tensors along the way. And so here are the bond dimensions of this intermediate tensor. And you, you look at the operations that you're doing, filling, putting in each tensor on this, and you find that it has a, a contraction time. Um, m cubed w squared times n. And this is um, a factor of uh, uh, w uh, more than the sweep of DMRG. And w for a hard system may be 40 or something. And so this, this variance calculation may be something like 20 or 40 times more expensive, which means nobody's going to do it, right? <clears throat> okay. So the question is, yes. So, so there's also this, yes. this way of extrapolating in the subleading gap of the transfer matrix, right? Ah. Can you look at that? Or? We, uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. We haven't explored that at all. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen it more like, you know, perhaps transfer matrix fixed points, but I think the, the reasoning should be the same here, that it should work. work yeah, with, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Interesting idea. Steve? So why, why do you expect that to behave well in the extrapolation with the variance? Oh, uh, so why should it behave with the, with the variance? Okay. Um, so, so, okay, so let me say, first of all, that, that all of the assumptions are, in order to, to have this sort of extrapolation work, you have to assume that there's some regularity in the way that a matrix product state will approximate the ground state as um, we increase the bond dimension. Okay, so then given that, you know, we have simple arguments about the variance. And, but, but more importantly, we have experience with exact calculations of the variance that show that it is very useful to extrapolate, right? And the truncation error is, is sort of natural because it's, it's you know, the, the sort of missing part of the wave function. Uh, Tomas, maybe you have a, yeah. This is certainly more standard as well, right? I mean, people do it in Monte Carlo and everything. Yeah. Uh, another question, expensive. so, if, uh, yeah, so computing variance is expensive, but could you make it cheaper if you say, I first optimize of an MPS, which approximates h times psi. So usually the approximating h times psi is another expensive object. Okay, that's... Uh, it, well, that's uh, probably cheaper, but should be like one pawn in W smaller, right? So. Uh, in practice, it, it, may, it may have better scaling. In practice, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit costly to, to build up the new... Uh, well, okay, so, sorry. The real reason is h times psi is just a higher energy wave function. It's got those small parts amplified, and so it's just going to need a bigger bond dimension. Yeah. OK, so can this be sped up with uh, sampling? OK, so, so, the pro so the sampling is thinking about individual spin configurations, uh, up-down patterns, say. And of course, we know that the probability of a pattern in a given wave function is just the absolute of psi squared of that. And you could imagine right away that there could be Markov chain methods that swept back th through the system proposing flips so that you uh, had a steady state solution that satisfied this uh, spin configuration. That would be very similar to, uh, to a, a lot of Monte Carlo methods. Okay, but we don't need any Markov chain method because there's something called uh, perfect sampling. Okay, so what is perfect sampling? So it's designed to uh, mimic a physical measurement, something that you would do in a laboratory. 
Um, so one of the key uh, things that we you know, think of you use in quantum computing is uh, if you measure bit by bit, uh, you get the same thing as if you measure the bits all at once. And you know, there's some conditional probabilities and people have been talking about it. Um, uh, you know, you can, it's, it's well known, it's uh, you know, something like the generalized Born uh, measurement rule or something. Um, but, so, so we can use that and measure bit by bit, okay? And, uh, and I think this is, even this has been talked about, but uh, let me just show you in detail. Um, so we can calculate, so first of all, we want to move the orthogonality, orthogonality center to site one. That means making all the tensors with this, this orthogonality, okay? And then we form the single site density matrix. Again, the last talk, we trace out everything else. That, because of the orthogonality, that just means taking the first tensor and connecting it this way with itself. Okay, so it's a, it's a trivial thing. And from this density matrix, we can calculate the probability of up and down. When we choose one with a random number, like we're doing, doing a physical measurement, and then we apply um, the state that we chose onto the tensor network, and it sort of erases one, one, one index, and we're left with a shorter tensor uh, a, a shorter uh, matrix product state. And so then we just work our way down. Okay, so this always works uh, beautifully. Um, it's always perfect sampling from this with no correlation time or anything and a very low cost. So the cost of this is the number of sites times your bond dimension squared. And the DMRG has an M cubed, so it's already a big win. And it, uh, there's also a factor of the MPO bond dimension better also. So you can do a lot of sampling. And uh, so it's very nice. So, so we could use this, for example, to evaluate the energy. Uh, now we already know the energy, so it's not in practice useful, but we just take the expression for the energy, insert a complete set of spin product states, okay? Uh, rearrange things, pull out the probability which is just this times its complex conjugate, okay? We, we throw that out, so we have to divide by one factor of this. And uh, so we, we sample with this probability, which is what the perfect sampling is doing, okay? And then we do an average of this ratio, which is called the local energy. So here's E local, and it's just uh, sort of sticking, you have S and psi, and you stick in the H on top, okay? So let me show you a quick uh, uh, example of measuring the energy that way. Okay, and uh, so here's the energy. This is a running average of the energy, and we know the exact energy for this particular state. And uh, so you can see, and, but notice that the uh, number of samples is rather large. Um, and so this is not looking so practical. It's like, oh, it's uh, showing a fair amount of fluctuations. Okay, so that's a little hint that uh, there's some potential issues. Okay, what about sampling the variance though? So here we insert our extra set of states right in the middle of the H minus E squared. And um, so if you do that, what you end up getting is an E local squared essentially. So it's, it's, it's computationally sort of efficient because it's sort of like the same sort of thing you evaluate for the energy, okay? But you get a bias. So this doesn't, isn't an exact calculation because if you look at this expression, uh, what about states where the P of S is zero, but they contribute to the expression from here? Those will be omitted. You'll never sample them. Okay, so that is a bias we call delta sub S. This turns out to be quite small, and it goes away as you increase the bond dimension. So we're not going to worry about that. But there is this bias that has sometimes been left out in writing these things down. Okay, and then we just take our local energy, subtract the, the energy that we know, square it, and average that, and we get an estimate of the variance. Okay, and so this is uh, our sampling. Okay. Sorry, why is that? Uh, bias because I mean you, you're just inserting an identity, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a divide by zero. So um, when I do this and I, you know, I have to pull out something, and there it would be a zero time divide by zero, and and it's not accounted for properly. 
Okay, so when we sample that, this is what we get. And notice this giant jump here, right? And so it's like um, there are, it's a distribution, you know, the expectation uh, from people who do Quantum Monte Carlo is like, oh yeah, this is, this is close to central limit theorem, this is nice, you know, you expect things to behave very well. And here we, we've done 200,000 samples, and then we get a big jump in the running average. So it was an enormous contribution. So this is really um, fat tails. So that's because you're dividing by extremely small piece, so that's kind of the smoothened version. I'll, of I'll talk more about what causes it. Okay, so, so let me just uh, compare with something else. There's an, another alternative way of not paying the price of calculating the full variance. Uh, Hubig et al. have a two-site uh, variance. Um, the exact variance is up here. So this is a rough approximation to it, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cheaper calculation. So that's, uh, that's sort of a very useful approach uh, for extrapolation if you, as I'll show you later, but okay. One other thing, uh, we wanted to sort of see these sort, this sort of bad behavior clearly. So we took a sort of nasty system it, that we could calculate exactly. Um, so it's, it's on a torus with, with peri fully periodic boundary conditions, which sort of doubles the area law contribution. It's sort of not the way we usually do DMRG, okay? But it's to show this sort of bad behavior. Okay, so here's another. So we decided to look at this by calculating not the sampling, but just look at every possible sample with an exact calculation and just plot them all. Okay, and so we get the, and, and what we also did was we said, okay, something is weird about the DMRG wave functions, and so let's compare it with a more conventional wave function, which we get from an, an imaginary time evolution from some sort of, you know, starting state. Okay, so the um, imaginary time just came from imaginary time evolution, so that would mimic the sorts of behavior you might expect in, in many methods like Monte Carlo, okay? Um, what the y-axis is showing here is the contribution to the variance. So it's got the probability um, of each thing times its contribution to the variance. Okay, and so what you see is that the imaginary time data, the red dots, are um, behaving very nicely. So the low probability things have low contributions, right? Then there's some high probability things. The DMRG data has these nasty outliers over here which are, have probabilities like 10 to the minus eight, but are contributing something significant uh, to the, uh, to the uh, variance. The contribution is if you multiply the PS in, so the actual contribution will be- Yeah, you can plot it in different ways. 10 to the yeah. minus four divided by 10 to the minus eight. Yeah, this is, so, so if I was sampling, I wouldn't want to multiply by this. And if I'm listing every one, it makes sense to give its probability. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. it means that in the sampling, this would contribute something like 10 to the four or so. Is that yeah, yeah, something big. <laughs> just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Okay, and uh, if we uh, plot it a different way, this is to make a sort of histogram of what happens, sort of the sum of the probabilities as a function, and this is on a big scale of the energy uh, deviation from the local energy. And you see that the, you know, everything is nice for the imaginary time evolution, and the DMRG wave function has its extreme outliers with, uh, you know, probabilities that are not so small. Okay, so, uh, let's see. So these are not single outliers, but several configurations? Sorry. I mean, Steve, uh, these are single outliers, each of these points? Or oh, several uh, points yeah, mostly they're, the they're, they're, they're single ones. I don't know if there's any, you know, duplications just from symmetry or something, but it's, it's you know, mostly single. Okay, so we want to understand why this is. And is it, you know, is something algorithmic or is it really built into the structure of, of matrix botic states? So to try to understand this, we, we looked at something that's a little bit different. And we could only do this on a small system, but we decomposed the approximate ground states that we had into superpositions of exact eigenstates, okay? And so we're doing like four by four systems where we can do that, and then we can look at, um, you know, how, how is, what is this, the energy spectrum of a DMRG wave function? 
Okay, now, our expectation before this, you know, I don't, mostly we didn't think too hard about it, but, you know, all of our experience is based on imaginary time propagation, Monte Carlo, and so we just tend to think, oh, yeah, your DMRG state isn't converged. It must have a few low-lying states mixed in, because that's, you know, but that's not true at all, okay? So that's what's true for the imaginary time evolution. You see, you know, some contributions of states that just drop off roughly exponentially here, as you'd expect. But we see, okay, so the, the main part is on the log scale, and this is on a, not on a log scale. You can see that the first, the, ground, the actual ground state is, is, has a very large weight in the state. It's, it's you know, 0.99 something. Okay, and then everybody else for the DMRG is, is at a tiny level, which we can see here is like the 10 to the minus four level, down, you know, a little bit lower, going to energies that are sort of much bigger than we usually expect for a system like this. So the energy distribution is, is just much broader than we uh, have come to expect. Okay, even more surprising is, suppose we drop out the ground state and we take the wave function that's the pure excited state component, that superposition, and we calculate its average energy. And then we look at that average energy as we make the DMRG more accurate by increasing the bond dimension. Okay, so that's what's shown in this. So these points along here are showing the DMRG getting more and more accurate as we increase the number of states. Okay, so the imaginary time is doing what you might expect, say, if there's a gap. And so it's sort of saturating. It's always mixing in a little bit of the Can you first say again what this piece. plot shows? At least I didn't get what the plot Sorry? shows. Can you say again what the plot shows? At yeah, least so, it's, so we, we, we have the wave function. We decompose it. We look at the part that it, it projects out the actual ground state. Okay, so it's like, where is the excited state? Okay, now the, in DMRG, this excited state piece has a very small weight. But where does it sit in energy? Okay. And that's the average of that value. And so this is that energy. So just, you know, that part of the wave function is psi h psi over its norm. So it's, it's the average energy yes, of that part. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, uh, Chris, is the imaginary time evolution over exact wave function? Not the MP, imaginary time evolution? Yes, 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 yes. You know, we, we may do it just by keeping a large bond dimension or, you know, but we, we make sure that there's no truncation coming into that or it would be sort of meaningless. Okay, so we, we don't go to zero. If, we, if it was truly gapless, we might expect this to go to zero, but if there's gaps and, uh, uh, you know, you expect it to saturate. So this is, this is to be expected, but notice that as we get more accurate, the energy of this residual part of the wave function is actually increasing dramatically. Okay, so that's, uh, that's very uh, surprising. Okay. Um, Is it actually important that you study 2D models? Because I realized you kept simulating 2D models, right? So, so we, we, we want to be able to see this without converging just so fast that you can't see anything. So we had to make the model challenging to sort of see this behavior. It's just like, you know, avoiding, you know, DMR, 1D system DMRG would just converge right away and it's hard to... But you would expect the same behavior in 1D or... So well, I think it's all there. It's just sort of, you know, you don't have many data points. It's, a, you know... Hard to see things. Okay. Um, and uh, so, but notice here, here is an example of looking uh, at the energy variance versus uh, the error in the energy. Um, you could flip it around and this would be an extrapolation. The variance is a way to extrapolate, right? You could, if you measure the variance, you would, you know, and you plot it on a straight line, you could measure how far away in the energy and then you could extrapolate to the exact energy. Um, both of these are behaving in a linear fashion, okay? So they're both, in principle, something you could extrapolate with, but, um, um, but it, uh, it's a dramatically different behavior between the two. Okay, so why do DMRG states have this strange energy separation? And, you know, we don't have anything rigorous for this, so I'll tell you what we have, which is like, you know, a hand waving, right? Rough hand waving. Okay, but so when you optimize an MPS ground state, you try to satisfy two criteria at once. One is low energy and the other one is small bond dimension. Okay, so I think this is just incompatible with being a superposition 
of a few low energy states. So suppose, for example, to sort of make it concrete, suppose for high accuracy we needed, say, a thousand states to get the ground state to some, you know, accuracy we're happy with. And the low-lying states tend to be slightly more entangled, but say we needed a similar number of states for that. Okay, and then now say our <coughs> approximate MPS has M equals 100. Okay, so if, it's a, if this guy is a superposition of these few excited states, it means that somehow you could take the millions of parameters in this bond dimension 1000 thing and take a few of them and magically they all cancel out and uh, you're left with a very small number of degrees of freedom in a bond dimension 100 state. So somehow it would, it would imply an almost linear dependence on these low-lying excited states, which, you know, there's, I don't think there's any reason to expect it. But in terms of, uh, so, so we think it just doesn't happen, <clears throat> but we don't have any, you know, we'd love to have this sort of all posed in sort of a, a, a nicer mathematical framework. Steve, yeah. did, did you take this for more models? So, so um, we, we have sort of a, uh, I'm showing, you know, uh, mostly the Heisenberg, but we, we have this sort of set of fairly simple representative models that we're trying to do things, Heisenberg models, Hubbard models, those sorts of things. So we think this is, this is generic. And can, can this be traced back to some physical property? Or, uh, because, I mean, it looks like uh, you are building the ground, uh, a low, low bond dimension ground state from a superposition of large bond dimension states, and somehow there is this magic cancellation that may be due to something, no? Yeah, it's just, I think more, it's, just, it's not so strange if you think about it a little bit more. It's sort of, you know, we're not used to thinking about it, this sort of decomposing a, a small parameter thing into to its superposition of exact things which have many, many parameters. But, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's something about that requires a whole lot of those very complicated things. And, and there's only so many states at the bottom of the spectrum. So it may be that they're, yeah, so just to have all of those, they're, they're forced to go up into the top of the spectrum. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so this is the uh, last slide except for the conclusions. Okay, so can we e revive or deal with this and still have an, a better extrapolation based on the sampled variance despite its large fluctuations? Okay, and the key idea here is that when you have an extrapolation, you don't have to have a perfect extrapolation. You don't have to have a perfect representation of something. You just need a very systematic behavior that you can extrapolate in. And so if we do a very systematic truncation of these outliers, we can hope that we can extrapolate it with, even with a, a crude uh, truncation. And so what we did was we just sort of threw away the data that was um, like the outer 5% from the energy, sort of make a window and throw away the stuff, which has a big bias. And so here is the energy variance that, um, so there's the exact here, and then there's that little bias I talked about at the beginning that, that gives you a tiny shift. And then there's the sort of noisy extrapolation, but with no truncation, okay? And then we throw away 1% of the outlier data, and then we throw away 5% of the outlier data. And you notice that the 5%, you know, it's a big shift away in terms of a big bias, but it um, is, is just much nicer to deal with the statistics. Okay, and so we have ways of looking at this and finding sort of a sweet spot for how uh, much we throw away. And then we can try these extrapolations, trying them on, you know, our range of models and sort of see how they compare with other methods. And, it, and this 95% really does quite nicely. So that's, that's the blue curve here. And, uh, you know, we're trying to extrapolate here. Here we're zooming in. There's the, uh, what we think is the ground state energy, and the blue is just doing very nicely, okay? The, the, without throwing away any samples, so the exact variance is the black. That doesn't have noise. But if we sample it, we get these sort of green things. And this is doing a, the number of samples, which is something that sort of, a, a cost that you might pay, like 1,000 samples. So, so it feels a bit surprising that the exact variance doesn't give the right extrapolation. 
It's weird, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like somehow it, it actually improves it a little bit to throw away these uh, outliers. And that's just, that's a surprise. That's just the test we have to this point. But it actually seems a little bit better. Um, you don't have a, an you know, and, and, and you know, eventually it's got to, it's got to come in. It's just showing that there's going to be something that didn't look, you know, there's going to be some sort of subtle shift in the curve as you get more and more accurate. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so, oh, and oh, then. Oh, oh, right, it's, it's a fit to the exact value. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a fit above here. a certain point, yes. which in practice is what we're going to want to do. Um, and then there's this two-site method, which you can see here, which also extrapolates uh, uh, nicely. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's another alternative, although we think our sampling is, is maybe a little bit better. Okay, so, so in conclusion, um, so DMRG ground states inherently have sort of this strange energy spectrum. Lots of weight in the exact ground state and very spread out, tiny contributions going to very high energies. Um, and this is very different from imaginary time approximate wave functions. Um, and biased truncated energy extrapolations work uh, quite well, providing sort of another tool in our toolbox for sort of practical DMRG calculations. Okay, thanks.